We're in part three of this series that we've called Rebel King, uh, the Jesus you never knew. And so we've been studying the parts of Jesus' personality and his characteristics that we kind of, we overlook or we just, you know, we just miss, I think. And, and for a lot of us, it's, it's the, the religious fog is, is what we're calling it. It's, it's maybe the re- religious upbringing that we had that had like a filter on Jesus. It was only, he was the sterile, serious kind and there was no other Jesus that, that we knew. And so in doing that, we kind of miss, we miss all there is to Jesus, all there is to his character and his personality. And it's hard to truly connect to someone that you don't know uh, uh, in totality. We don't know their personality. And whether maybe you haven't been around religion, but you have a perspective about Jesus, maybe a picture in your mind about him that may be just off. And, and in this series, we're really diving deeper into who Jesus is because it's one thing to know about him. It's one thing to know about Jesus, know about the Bible, but it's another thing entirely to know him personally, to know him personally. And, and we've been studying in uh, previous weeks, Matthew chapter 7, there's actually going to be a time where we stand before God. And Jesus says, many are going to think that they know me. They're going to say, hey, I know you. I know you, Jesus. He's going to say, who are you? I don't, I don't know you. And my heart's desire for every one of us that are here is that you would Find yourself at that place, which every one of us will stand before God. And, I, and my, my desire is that, is that you would hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord, your master's happiness. And, and so that's like why a series like this is so important, because it's easy to check in and check out, isn't it? Can we be honest? It's easy to check into our Christianity and check out, to check in at church and to, and to check out. And so we need to we need, to re- we need to know the real Jesus, not the picture that's been painted for us, not the, not the preconceived thoughts or ideas that were told to us or that we developed by ourselves, or who knows where they came from. But we need to know the real Jesus because so much hinges on that. We, that, that in order to have that real, the, the power and the peace and the life that God has for us, it's, it's, it's contingent upon truly knowing the real Jesus and not just knowing about, but knowing personally, to being in a personal relationship with Jesus. So we've, we've decided to take four parts of his personality, um, parts that are overlooked, but par- his personality that, can't, that will allow you to connect to him deeper than you have ever connected with him before. So in part one, a couple weeks ago, we said Jesus has fun. Aren't you grateful that Jesus has fun, somebody? Come on. That our God has fun. He actually created fun. He created humor. He gave us a sense of humor even you, all right, even some, he did, it's there, it's somewhere, no, I'm kidding, but it's Jesus, he has, he has fun, man, and so we, we took a look at some of the scriptures like we've done every week, and taking a look at the scriptures from a, without the filter that we put on, serious Jesus, always serious, and we took a look and said, hey, this looks like a, a playful Jesus here, could I have been reading the Bible wrong and misinterpreting the characteristic and personality of Jesus that he's actually, he can be playful and he can be fun, that's what we talked about in in part one. In part two, uh, we said Jesus is human. Another, another aspect of, of, of Jesus' personality characteristic that just is, is overlooked. We forget that he's fully God. Yeah, but he's also fully man, and he chose to come to earth and be this way for us, that, that, that he would take on all of humanity, empty himself of his divinity so that he could relate to you and me personally, that he would understand our issues and our hangups. The Bible says he was tempted in every way as we are tempted. It was his choice to be a human so that he can personally be known and known by you. Jesus was human, and he is human. Even the resurrected Jesus is still Jesus resurrected. It's, it's still Jesus, flesh and bones and hungry and all. So we studied that last week, and I know that these have been stretching us a little bit to see Jesus differently, but in doing so, again, it's going to help us relate to him personally as we really look at the scriptures without the filters that we've developed over the years. Today, um, not in your notes, but this is kind of, this is where we're going, you guys. We're going to talk how, about how Jesus is honest. Jesus is what? Honest. Of course you know that, though. I mean, he's Jesus, right? Of course, of course Jesus is honest, but again, in this series, we're not, we're not just interested in knowing about the honesty of Jesus. We need to know personally and experientially the honesty of Jesus. And, and I'm titling today's message, The Disruptive Honesty of Jesus. It was so essential, important that Jesus would disrupt the status quo of his age because in the time that he was coming in, 
um, people had gotten so comfortable following the letter of the law that they missed the heart of the law. Amen, somebody? That they were so outwardly, like, like they, they did the right things, said the right things, performed the right rituals. So he, he came in and he challenged the status quo. He challenged the Sabbath rituals. In the scriptures, he challenged the, the, the temple rituals and purity rituals, and he would come, and they, they totally missed all the commandments and all the, the what we were supposed to do. They missed the heart of it, so it needed the disruptive honesty of Jesus to expel that, that religious fog that we've been talking about that people caught themselves in. And if there is, I think, a, a message that is needed in our culture today, it's this one, guys, that, that I think we, again, find ourselves in a time where, where we need the honesty, the disruptive honesty of Jesus to invade our life again because we have become so comfortable in our Christianity, we're missing the heart of it, I think. That it's so easy to come in and come out and check in and check out of our religious duties or, or the expectations. And it's really easy to do the A, B, C, and D of Christianity and miss the heart of knowing Jesus. So today we're gonna study the disruptive honesty of Jesus and in like fashion, I'm just, I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to disrupt you a little bit, okay? I'm, I'm going to just disrupt. We're going to look at some scriptures. We're going to study some scriptures like we've done in this series, and we're going to look at them without the filter of serious, sterile Jesus. And we're, we're going to look at the, the disruptive honesty of Jesus in these different instances and see really what it means for us and how we can let that invade and, 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 and affect um, our life more. Now, to, before I get into this first scripture, I need you, to, in order to grasp how wild this verse is, I want you to imagine that you have been invited to, the, to dine with a royal dignitary. And there's a lot of dignitaries that are there. I want you to just go there with me and imagine this. Say it's the queen. You've been invited to dine with the queen and all these other royal dignitaries, and you're so excited about it, and everybody's going in, and you're going in, and you're caught up with the palace and looking. But, but everyone's like doing their thing and bowing before the queen. But, but imagine this, that you got so caught up that you just walk right by the queen, and you didn't bow, and you just, ah. and then by the time you, you notice, because everyone's, oh, everyone gasped, and all the eyes turn to you in the room, and you notice, like, oh my gosh, I missed something, there was a social norm that I, that I, that I missed, what would you do, what would you do in that, in that moment, because that happened to Jesus, that happened to Jesus. Let me, okay, in, in, in Luke chapter 11, here's what it says in your notes. When Jesus had finished speaking, a, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. Now, the Pharisees were religious leaders of their time. This was a prestigious thing to come into the home of this religious leader. So he went in and he reclined at the table. But check this out. The Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. This was something that was customary for centuries this is what you do. Before you go into the house, you sit at the table, you wash your hands, and then you go sit down. And then it says, the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Okay, look at, I mean, come on. Jesus says some funny things, right? He's got some, and this is why we, I love Jesus so much, because he says, he's so courageous. He says the things that everyone else is thinking, you know what I mean? He is just honest. Jesus, listen, has entered this man's home. He was invited to this guy's, yeah, for real, she's a gangster. that's right, invited to this man's home, and he just, I mean, it's customary for centuries, this is what you do, you wash, so he bypasses the line at the wash basin, and he just goes right to the table and starts picking up the bread with his dirty hands, and then, uh, you know, knowing their thoughts and probably seeing the gasp on the Pharisees, you know, you know, eyes and mouth and just everyone looking at him, he just, you know, oh, the wash, the washing bit, yeah, yeah, I just, I mean, I just don't see the point of it. Outwardly, you're, you're sensational, but inwardly, you are evil and vile. Come on. Jesus says some crazy things. Apparently, Jesus does not mind ever being invited back to this guy's house. I mean, you need, when we look at Jesus, the disruptive honesty of Jesus, we have to understand that, that as we're watching Jesus, we're watching love in motion. This is love. Look, this isn't just, this isn't brutal honesty. This is disruptive honesty, and there's a difference. Brutal honesty seeks brutality to wound and hurt. That's not Jesus' intention at all. Jesus' disruptive honesty shakes up status quo. 
It has us see things differently. It, it seeks a transformation, a change, a healing that God desperately wants to take place. The, the, Jesus' entire ministry while he was on earth, his entire three, three and a half years that he was on earth, was one long intervention that needed disruptive honesty. Man and the religious system had gotten so far off track that they needed to, he needed to speak to the heart of it. It needed disruptive honesty disruptive honesty. And there's a reason for that in your notes, because Jesus can't heal us unless we become honest, church. In order for Jesus to truly heal the hurts, the past, the wounds, those areas of our life, we have to become honest with God. Hebrews chapter 12 says like this, that my child, don't underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God, or get depressed when he has to correct you. Look, I know it doesn't feel good when God has to correct you. No one, no one likes that, but he continues. For the Lord's training of your life is actually evidence of what? Of his faithful love. You see, that's why he wants to speak disruptive honesty into, the, into our souls, to the heart of the real issues that are going on in our life. Not to hurt us, but it is because he's his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, it actually proves that you're his delightful child. And when we, don't, we don't like the correction. We don't like the disruptive honesty that shakes us up and really reveals us to us. We don't like it very much. And there's, there's some reasons why we're not honest. And I want to show you three of them today and then look at some scriptures and uh, in, in really from this angle of the disruptive honesty of Jesus and learn today what that means for us. But there's some reasons. There are some reasons why today we might not walk honestly or be honest honest. Write some notes with me, you guys. Here's number one. Number one is we are insecure. We are insecure. Our insecurity prevents us from being honest. You see, we don't want people to see our issues. We don't want people to see our scars. We don't want we to be judged by them because we have a mindset about them. We'd rather, we'd rather not face our mistakes and our issues. We'd, we'd rather look at our own lives through rose-colored colored glasses. And we get to choose the bifocals, right? Because I got, uh, it's because, oh, well, I'm a good dad. I'll put those, I'm a good dad though, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a good wife, I'm a good employee, I'm a good leader, I'm a good Christian, and we, we filter our lives through a perspective that paints us the way we want to be painted, and insecurity will prevent us from walking in honesty and integrity. Look at Luke chapter 10, um, Jesus, this is, and we've read this a few times, uh, maybe in the last several months here, look at it through this filter of seeing the honesty of Jesus. Now as they were traveling along, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his words. She's just kind of soaking it in. But it says, Martha was distracted with all the preparations. So preparing before Jesus came, she's cleaning up, getting all ready. When Jesus is there, she's making sure the food's ready and all ready. And, she just, and then after it's done, she makes sure it's all clean and clean. She's just, she's just busy, distracted, preparing. And she came to Jesus and said, Lord... Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. Now, Jesus could have jumped into that hornet's nest right there, okay? Two bickering sisters. He's, he's wise enough not to jump right into that, but, but check out the wisdom and the disruptive honesty. It says, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried, worried and upset about many things. Only one thing is important. Mary has chosen the better thing and it will never be taken away from her. See, if it, if it were me, I would have probably tried to um, relieve the tension, try to diffuse the situation, maybe even offer Mary to help myself. Oh, it's okay, Mary, I'll, I'll help you out. I would have jumped in in that. But, but Jesus is, he's secure enough in who he is to speak the truth into that. And I, I just love the courage of Jesus to say what everyone else is thinking and to appreciate the the beauty of, of this, think, of, think how rarely this occurs. Think of, or even more rarely it's done well. Most people go their entire lives without ever anyone speaking honestly to them about the most disruptive and, and, and damaging issues in their lives. Pause for a moment and think about, think about a time where this was done for you, where someone spoke directly, truthfully, lovingly, but honestly into some of the hidden, damaging things that are affecting you and your relationships and your future in your life. Or better yet, think about any time that you have done this well 
not just done this to hurt, but done this well to anybody else that you love, that you spoke directly and honestly to the damaging issues in their lives. See, so many people, they, they go throughout their entire life without embracing the disruptive honesty of Jesus, which leads me to the second reason why we're not honest. Number two is we're cowardly. We're cowardly. I know that's a tough word. I told you I was going to disrupt some things today, okay? Oh, we're afraid. We're a little bit fearful. Sure, but that's not really what the true definition of cowardice is. I looked up the definition. Check this out, you guys. Cowardice is a trait wherein fear and excessive self-concern override doing or saying what is right, good, and of help to others or oneself in a time of need. It is the opposite of courage. As a label, cowardice indicates a failure of character in the face of a challenge. I don't know about you, but by that definition, I have been cowardly in my life. Why, why, why though? Because if we're honest, why we're, we're not, and we're talking about dishonesty, but if we were honest, why we're cowardly? It's because we don't want to pay the bill. Because honesty costs us. It, it, it makes relationships messy. It makes us vulnerable. That's what, that's what honesty, it costs us. Because you even have a saying, they kill the messenger, don't they? I mean, they kill Jesus. I mean, what, what am I going to do? So you, you, we try to just, you know, hold, hold back and we say, oh, ain't, ain't none of my business then. So, someone else is going to handle that one. Someone else is going to speak into that one. And Jesus could have done that to Martha, but he would have left her in a religious mindset, self-righteous spirit, and he would not have spoken to the heart of the issue that was at hand. Martin Luther King, he had this quote. He said, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Is it safe? Because I mean, I'm not going to do it if, I can, if, if it costs me something. And if we're honest, the reason why we are not honest is because it's unsafe. To be honest, it costs us to be honest. Matthew 23, 15. Let's look at this. Jesus here. Woe to you. I mean, again, he's, he's calling out the hypocrisy of the religious system that they just, again, following the letter of the law, missing the heart of the law, scribes and Pharisees. You hypocrites, because you travel around the sea and dry land to make one convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Okay, look here, I'm not giving you permission to be like, uh, to just fought, be a fault finder into people's life or to criticize people you don't even know, you don't even know them, you don't know their situation, you have no understanding about, and I'm not, listen, I'm not giving you permission to be a jerk in the name of ministry real talk. No, 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 no. See, there's a difference between being raw and being real. See, raw contaminates real hills. And all the stuff today, all oh, just real, is mostly all the stuff people are talking about is real today is just raw. You're, you're just vomiting. You have no filter. You're just uh, vomiting about everything you think on people and everything about yourself. It's just raw out there, and it's contaminating. But real is authentic, vulnerable, and leads to healing, Amen. not contamination. Okay, so I'm not giving you permission to, to do that. I'm just, I'm talking about the courage that it takes to speak into moments that would bring health and healing, and wholeness that we bypass because of cowardice. Are you getting disrupted today? Amen, somebody. Okay, take the, here, here's, here's the third reason why we're not honest, and that is we're hiding. We're just hiding. We're hiding our issues. We're hiding our scars. We don't want people to see what's really going on behind the scenes, in the dark, the real me, the real issues. We don't want to face it. And people do a lot of things to, to hide or to not face the truth. They'll, they'll leave jobs. They'll leave relationships to not face the truth. They'll, they'll rearrange. People will rearrange their whole life and their whole schedule, change their route to work. They'll do a lot of things to just not face that person, that issue, that situation, because I just don't want to don't want to face it. I don't want to face it. And this, this is in John chapter 4 is exactly what the woman at the well was doing. If you read the entire story in John chapter uh, four, like uh, I only have verse 15 through, through 19 up here, but if you read the entire story, it actually says that in the beginning of chapter four that this woman, this Samaritan woman came at, at noontime to go fetch her water, which, which it was, that was not the time that was customary to go fetch water from the well. 
everyone would go in the morning. All the women in that culture would go in the morning because it was not under the noonday sun, where not only it was hot for them to make the trek and the back and forth with the, with the water, but the water itself was at a different temperature at that time as well. So everyone would come at the morning, but she was hiding from people. She didn't want to see some of those women for some reason, we're going to find out, but she didn't want to have interaction with these ladies, so she was in hiding and came at a time where no one would come because she didn't want people to see. And Jesus is there reclining or sitting at that well, and he has that interaction with her. That he says, hey, if, if you were to drink of living water, you'll never thirst again. He says, I have living water. And then the woman said to him, sir, give me some of that water so I won't be thirsty again, and I won't have to keep coming back here and talking to these women. These women don't like me. I don't ever want to come to this well again. Give me some of that water. I'm just, I want to be done with this well. And he told her this, go call your husband and come back. I have no, no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. See, the fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you have now that's the reason why you don't want to come during the morning, because that woman that you stole him from will slap your face. <laughs> the man you have now ain't the man. He's not your husband either. What you have just said is quite true, sir, the woman said. I can see that you're a prophet, which is funny. You read that, you continue to read it. What she does, she goes, she's just get she got disruptive honesty of Jesus, spoke right to the heart of her real issues that she's hiding from. And what does she do? Oh, you must be a prophet. And then she, you got to read the whole, she goes, hey, you know what? The Jews worship on this mountain and Samaritans, we worship on this mountain. She has a theological discussion with Jesus, which is so funny to me. She just got called out, disruptive honesty, and she's all, oh, wow, let's talk about the Bible. Well, let's talk about the Bible. I just, I wonder how many people fit that bill where you come in, in and out. You want to talk about the Bible, but you don't want God to reveal you to you. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. I mean, we need the disruptive honesty of Jesus to shake up our lives again, you guys. We need it. We've missed it. Could it be we got comfortable in our Christianity like they were comfortable in their law abiding, you know, system? just missing the heart of it. And, and, and at the heart of it, even, even the law itself, the law was not, the law was given as God was trying to implement and institute a moral code. That's what he was trying to reveal his heart to his people. Look here, Exodus chapter 20 is, is the list of the 10 commandments. The ninth commandment has to do with what we're talking about today. He says, you shall not give false testimony against your, who? Your neighbor. Now, your neighbor in the Bible, anytime it says your neighbor, it's not really your neighbor, neighbor. Jesus was asked, hey, what's the greatest commandment by some religious leaders? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then they asked him the question, well, who is my neighbor? And then he told the story of the Good Samaritan. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Amen? You guys awake? Come on. Amen? <laughs> so, and then, but they, Jesus says, your, your neighbor is anyone you come in contact with. Anyone you come past, that's your neighbor. So look, I'm not as concerned, and I don't think God is as concerned, although he was implementing a religious code, a law that they would practice and did practice, but I'm not as concerned for you that you would lie under oath in, the, you know, in court, you know, in a murder case or something like that, but I am concerned that many of us violate the heart of this law, the principle of this law, and the principle of this law, I believe, is the principle of honesty. That what God was trying to, to show us was his heart, was his character. He was trying to put within us the heart of God, this, this personality of Jesus, this honesty. And I think God's trying to, he's trying to disrupt some things in our life if we let him. I was, I was um, going through this men's Bible study years ago. It was, it was like a character study, and there was a survey in the study. And it would ask us yes or no questions, and, and one of them was like, you know, do, do you have anyone you need to forgive? Yes or no? And, and there wasn't anything else. It was just yes or no. So, so one of the questions was, do you have any impure sexual thoughts? Have you ever had any? And it wasn't, there was not sometimes, once, you know. It was just yes or no. So it, it, one of the questions it had, I, I want to show you in this, in this character study, it, it asked this question. Are you a liar? I'll be honest. Because I was ready to answer the question, are you a liar? But then I saw, be honest. 
And it didn't have sometimes or once or anything. It was just like, yes or no, what are you? And I had to have a heart check there. Because do you, do you ever exaggerate the truth? Do you ever stretch out? Do you ever tell a story that favors you in the end a little bit more than it probably should? I mean, we gotta, I think we have to let the disruptive honesty of Jesus affect our life. We got to come to the place where we get honest. So what I want to do today is give you three simple ways to develop honesty in your life to a greater degree that, that, that probably you have, many of us have ever had before. Three, th- three ways, you guys. Here's number one, and it has to start right here. Number one is we have to be honest with who? With yourself. Be honest with yourself. I told Veronica that this, when I was preparing this message, that this is probably one of, one of the harder messages that I preached because, because dishonest people are dishonest. <laughs> Meaning, like I could be preaching about honesty, but dishonest people have convinced themselves that they're not dishonest. I even told her, I said, I can't even help dishonest people. I can't help them. You can't, I, I, because, you know, you work with, I work with dishonest people. They're like, you can't pin them down on anything. It's, he's always got an excuse or no, no, no. He's always got a reason. Why? It's not me or it's not that. Look, and I want to tell you something. I, not only I can't help you, but God can't help you. God cannot help you unless you become honest. And what I've figured out, the problem is, is what I found is that people, they're, they have so much hurt. They're so, they have hurts and they have wounds from their, from their past that they really haven't received healing yet from God. And so it almost makes them to where they have to be dishonest because they don't face the issue. So if I'm not going to face the issue, I have to be dishonest. And I'm telling you, if you can't be honest about your mistakes, you'll never be free. If you can't be honest with yourself, you'll never be free. A while back, someone on on our staff here at Discovery, they, they made a mistake, and they said, they, they owned up to it quickly. Pastor Jason, I missed it. I missed it here, um, but here's what I'm going to do about it. I'm really sorry, but here's, here's what I'm going to do about it. And I said, hey, thank you so much for owning up to that. you got to be, a lot of people don't, but thank you for doing that. But here's, let me tell you something. I told them, I expect you to make mistakes. Like, you're going you're gonna to make mistakes. You're going to miss it at times. And there's two reasons, because number one, you're growing, just like all of us. And number two, you're human. And, and I've noticed something in pastoring for so many years is that humans tend to make mistakes. <laughs> they just do. And in, until we kind of can come to terms with that and be okay with that and get honest with ourselves, then we'll never really be free. Psalm 51, verse 6 says, God delights it when you're honest with yourself. When truth reigns in your inmost being, we have to learn to be honest with ourselves. And until we get to there, just step one, honest with yourselves. Uh, you can't really move any further. God can't help you. I can't help you. Ain't nobody can help you until you become honest with yourself. But, but when you do, if you can do that today, and I really hope you do, and I hope this disruption doesn't cause you to go into a hole, but shake some things up to allow stuff to come to the surface. Because if, if you can be honest with yourself, then you can do number two. You can be honest with others. You can be honest with others. Have you ever been talking with someone and they say, well, to be honest with you, what? Where were you, where were you before? Or, or, or this, or have you ever heard, well, now, let me be honest with you. Now, now we're going to be honest? Okay, good to know. And I, I'm serious, like, if some of you, if that's in your vocabulary, if you use that in your language, I would consider changing it. I would, because you you're not going to say, well, now I'm going to lie to you. You're not going to, okay, well, let me show you how far God takes this being honest with others thing. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another, literally your sins toward others, literally, and then pray for one another to be what? God, he actually wants you, he wants to heal you, but it's, there, there's a contingency of your honesty on your healing. So he says, for tremendous power is released through the passionate, heartfelt prayer of the godly believer. Now, why did he have to say that? Why did, why did the Bible just say, confess your sin to God? Hey, just confess your sin to God and you're going to be healed. God will hear you. No, because honesty is so critical to our humility and our accountability that God invites us to help one another. And this is the reason why you need to be in a small group here at Discovery Church. 
You, if you want to bring um, light into those dark areas of your life, you're going to have to get honest with somebody. And I'm not advocating you to come into this space with hundreds of people and lay out all your issues or come up here on a mic and share all your issues with people. I'm not advocating for that. That would be not wise. But I am saying you got to let someone in. You have to let someone in that, 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 those, that, that God's healing that is waiting for you of your past, of the wounds, of the, those things that you're just hiding from. Uh, they, it's contingent upon you being honest with other people. I told you I can't help people who are dishonest. And what I found is that people are so, they're hurt, they're wounded from their past. They haven't come to terms with it. They really, I can't help them. There was this doctor, um, his name's Doc, Henry Cloud. Uh, is, he's an author. Phenomenal. He wrote a lot of phenomenal books, Dr. Henry Cloud. But one of the books he wrote is called Necessary Endings. And if you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you're a business owner, if you lead any type of people in church or, or out in the, in, the, in the world here, secular world, you need to read this book, Necessary Endings by Dr. Henry Cloud. And he says there's basically three types of people in the Bible, three classes of people in the Bible. They are wise, foolish, and evil. And you need to know who you're working with. You have to know. See, because the wise will accept correction. Though actually what you do when you bring the truth to the wise, they adapt themselves to the truth. They'll say, oh, you bring truth to the wise, they'll go, oh, thank you. They'll thank you. Thank you for that truth. And now I know I need to do this instead of this. I will change my behavior, my life. My, I'm going to change to adapt myself to the truth. But if you tell the truth to a foolish person, they adapt the truth to them not themselves, themselves are the truth. They'll go, they'll say something like, oh, well, that's not what really happened. Oh, you see, you see what happened? See, the reason was because, and in that situation, and what I did, and what they said, and what, and, 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 uh, they'll adapt the truth to themselves, never themselves to the truth, and they won't thank you for it. There's a Proverbs chapter 9, verse, verse 8 says, do not rebuke a mocker, literally a foolish person, or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they'll love you. They'll thank you for it. Um, you know, he, he goes on to say that you can't, Dr. Henry Cloud says, you cannot correct a foolish person with words. They will not receive words as correction. You can't correct a foolish person with words, only consequences. Come on, I'm preaching to someone here that's a supervisor, a manager, a leader, because you know you've been talking and talking and talking and trying and using all kinds of words, and it ain't working. It ain't ever going to work. Because they're a fool. It ain't me. That's Bible, okay? I'm sorry, guys. That's, that's the Bible. I told you I was going to disrupt some things a little bit. We need the disruptive honesty of Jesus in our lives again. Now, what about the evil person? What do we do with that? You got wise. You got foolish. You got, you got evil. What do you do? Titus chapter 3, verse 10 tells us that warn a divisive person and evil. See, the Bible says that divisive people are evil. The people who divide homes, divide loyalties, divide families, divide relationships, divide churches, divide leaders. D those divide, he says, what are you going to do? Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, the third time, have nothing to do with them. Amen. You cannot help an evil person. You can't help them. Or you warn them, speak the truth in love, be honest. But after the third time, Look, let God deal with him, not you. Amen. You cut that person off and you get away. Yeah. There's three types of people. You just need to know who you are dealing with. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying here, guys, is you got to get honest. You have to get honest with yourself. If you want to be healed, you want to be free. You have to be honest with yourself. And then after that, after you're honest with yourself, you can be honest with others. You can let some people in, man. Get into a small group here at Discovery. Build some relationships, some trust. And let some people in and see the real you and what's really going on, or else you'll never be healed. You'll never be free. But then if we can do that, then we can, then we can do this third one, which is really the most important, is to be honest with God. To be honest with God. Can you imagine how God feels when you're dishonest with Him? I want you to think about that. Like, think about how God feels. Like, like say you blew it last week. You totally blew it, but you've talked to God three or four times since then, and you didn't bring it up like he doesn't know, right? Have you ever had, moms, have you ever had your child try to lie to you when they were young, young? They got lipstick all over their face, and you're like, no, I didn't do it. Have you ever had that? Or they're trying, they're, they're got something behind their back, literally behind you, five years old, behind their back. Hey, what you got there? Nothing. 
Come on, man. You're five years old. I'm smarter than you, kid. I see you. What are you doing? All right. Well, can you imagine how God feels, right? Who knows us and sees us and knows it all. He knows it. And, and the, 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 the sad thing is, is that he's already forgiven us for it. He's already paid for it, forgiven us for it, and has healing waiting for us, yet we're hiding. We're behind fear. We're behind it and not, not wanting to reveal it. He already knows. Psalm 32. David wrote this psalm. He said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Can I get an amen, somebody? Aren't you thankful that God has covered, forgiven, that they're not counted against you? All your past, present, future sins, it's not counted against you, but, 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 but why? How? Against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. See, D David's showing us something here that when we're dishonest with ourselves, when we're not walking in honesty with others or with God, then we have a spirit of deceit. There is a lying spirit that is inside of us that's robbing us of healing, of wholeness, of being free, truly free. And then he goes on to say, for when I, when I kept silent, when I kept it in because I was afraid, I was, being, I was being a coward, or I was just trying to hide it, man, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, God, your hand was heavy upon me. I knew what I was doing. I knew, I really knew that you knew, but I tried to act like you didn't know, that you didn't see, and I was just trying to skate around it, trying to pretend, but it was heavy. I knew it, God. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But then he says, but then I acknowledged my sin to you. Amen. I finally got to this place where I stopped hiding, where I stopped pretending, where I took off my mask, and I stopped acting like you didn't know anyway, and I acknowledged my sin to you. You already knew it, though, and I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And then you did it, God. And then you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. Listen, God already paid for your shortcomings, your sins your mistakes, your issues. You know, when King David wrote this psalm, Psalm 32, listen, don't pack up just yet. When King David wrote this psalm, Psalm 32, this wasn't the giant slaying king that wrote this. He wrote this right after his adultery with Bathsheba. See, this wasn't the giant slaying king. This was the husband murdering, wife stealing, adulterer David who wrote this. And actually, he, 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 you go read that story, he tried to cover it up so well. He had this elaborate story. It was good. It was a good cover-up. He got good at lying, like many of us have. Let me tell you a quick story. I'm running out of time. But when I remember when I was really young. I don't know how young, but just a young kid, man. And I stole some money from my mama's nightstand. Don't gasp at me like that, like you ain't ever done anything like that, okay? Don't be judging me. I stole some money. It's a little kid, and I remember my mom grabbing everybody together, say, hey, I had some money on nightstand. It's gone. We're going to find it. She knew. We're going to find it. So we all look. We all look. Look at everywhere. Of course we're not going to find it. It's in my pocket, man. <laughs> and so we come back together, and, and mom's like, you know, oh, we're all like, it's not here. And she's like, no, it's in this house, and nobody's leaving until we find it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get caught. So we go back out to the search and, and I thought, I'm a little kid, you know, and, and, and there's just the single chair in the living room. And I thought behind the chair on the floor, I wasn't as good a liar as David back then. You know, David had this elaborate story. I'm just like, oh, it must have, it must have fell out of your pocket, mom. Here you go. And, and my mom wasn't having it. She's like, no, 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 you took it. I know you took it, Jason. <gasps> yeah. Oh, sorry. She gave me a big old spanking, man. I mean, she used weapons, I'm going to tell you. It's back, back in the day when moms used weapons to whoop us, okay? I got, I got a whooping for the, for the stealing, and then I got a whooping for the lying. And, and she did a good thing there doing that, separating the two. But, but the enemy... The enemy whispered to me, and I didn't think it was the enemy then, but I, 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 I see it as it now. The enemy whispered to me in the second spanking. And, and, and he, this, is, this is what he said. This is the thought I had. You know what? I got to get better at lying. Don't, hey. And I did. 
And so did you. We all did. We all, we all got really good at covering up, at being dishonest. And so did David. David got good. And, and, and the enemy would tell you, hey, oh, oh, what you need to do next time is not get caught. What you need to do is just cover this up really good, keep it in the dark, and as long as it's in the dark, you will never experience healing and freedom. We need the disruptive honesty of Jesus. Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship.